Welcome to my channel. My name is Biblio Sophie. No, that's not my name. That's my channel's name. My name is Sophie. Biblio Sophie. The more keenly observant of you, sartorially speaking, might notice that I'm wearing exactly the same outfit as I am in the last section of my uh, blurb telephone video. And that is because as of filming this, it is uh, September 25th. I just finished off uh, reading some books for uh, the Linen Librarian's uh, blurb telephone uh, prompt, and I am starting another um, book influencer uh, prompted challenge, which is Jessica's Tiny Book Challenge. This is given to us by uh, Jessica's Bookstack on Instagram. Uh, this is the third round of the Tiny Book Challenge. I believe now it has been changed to a two-week affair so that you can really get in as many tinies as possible. So what is this aforementioned challenge? Well, briefly put, it is to read as many short books. Um, the idea is under 150 pages, but you can tailor that to whatever you want, whatever feels tiny to you. Booktube is a very tailoring to your uh, personal needs sort of environment, I feel. Um, and ideally maybe to read a book a day. Um, but yeah, just kind of go through the slim things in your bookshelf or in your TBR or get inspired by other people. You know the drill. Um, how do we ever find books? Uh, so I have a few short things that are currently in my bookshelf, but actually um, I have fed myself very, very much from the library. I picked up a bunch of short books. Uh, some of these have been on my radar for a while, and then some of them, honestly, I just started walking around and picking out slim things from the stacks. Uh, I started today with Res Fatif by Toni Morrison. If you watched any number of my other videos, you know that I'm trying to read a bunch of Toni Morrison this year, so this has been on my radar, definitely. Uh, this is her only short story. I haven't read it yet. Um, I have read the long uh, introductory, uh, introductory essay by Zadie Smith, which is excellent, um, which is about the ambiguity of race in the story, but I haven't read the story yet. So I will get back to you a little bit later on that. Uh, some other things that have been on my radar for a while that I'm taking the opportunity to read because they are short uh, is Minor Detail by Adenia Shidley, uh, which has sort of been making the rounds uh, Cold Enough for Snow by Jessica Owl, which definitely made a lot of the booktube uh, rounds, and Boulder by uh, Ava Balthazar, similarly making the rounds, uh, and specifically that I was turned on to by uh, Rebecca Eats Books, who recently reviewed it in a wrap-up. So those are some of the ones that I'm definitely wanting to get to this week, uh, and the rest I might nibble at. I don't have as much of a clear uh, agenda to get to them. Actually, with the exception of a book that I do own, this is not coming from the library, this is Moore Sunshire's uh, Bless the Daughter Raised by a Voice in Her Head, um, which I am <laughs> uh, reading for um, Katie James Book Club. Uh, as the, I guess the September, yes, this is the September outing. Uh, I don't think poetry is um, unallowed in the challenge, but I think I'm probably not going to be reading poetry books. I'll probably stick to uh, either novels or maybe nonfiction, but uh, probably will be sticking to prose. All right, let's see how I do. I can fit Boulder in my pocket, which I love in a book. Beautiful weather, it is an absolutely perfect day. Another gorgeous day. Yes, I am still wearing this coat, it's just my thing now. Uh, beautiful walk outside, could not help but acquire a bunch of books. 
have upon my person any number of things. I still have a boulder on me, which I hadn't quite finished. Uh, a friend of mine that I met up with gave me back tiny moons that she had borrowed from me. I purchased for myself, for a relatively steep price, ugly feelings, and I'm excited to get into it. And I found the following random things. Some criticism by Robert Hughes. This very uh, peculiar thing that I plan to cut things out of, an Ezra Pound record, and this pamphlet. I thought I'd sit down for a few minutes to talk about uh, the two fiction books that I've finished so far uh, as part of the Tiny Books Challenge. Uh, I already mentioned Recitatif, I was in the midst of reading this uh, a couple of days ago, or rather I had finished Zadie Smith's essay on the Morrison. I hadn't, fin I hadn't read yet uh, the Morrison part of the book, as you can see it's very tiny, and uh, the Morrison story is really just a short story. It's the only short story she published um, in 1983, I believe. It's fantastic, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's very much a Morrison story and it's very intriguing to have such a distilled story because uh, I'm used to full-length novels from her. Uh, so it's really amazing how much you can do in just, I think, something like 40 pages. Um, yeah, not maybe not even, I think it is. It's actually, it's exactly 40 pages, wow. Uh, so this is the story of two girls, Roberta and um, Twyla. Uh, one is black and one is white, and we never find out who's who. Uh, both of them are um, kind of symbolically orphaned, uh, and they meet at a shelter. They both have mothers who are alive, but who can't take care of them. One, because she is a dancer, probably a nightclub dancer, uh, and uh, the other one because she is indisposed. She's sick and can't take care of her daughter. Uh, so they meet at a shelter when they're eight, I think, uh, and then we see them uh, kind of fall out of touch and by sheer coincidence re-encounter one another uh, a couple other times throughout their life. Uh, and this is, uh, this was an experiment, an, an exercise for Morrison of how much she could write about uh, race relations in a very, very specific way without ever telling us uh, who is black and who is white in the story. So it's also very much an exercise uh, in discomfort to a certain extent um, for the audience of the story because we are probably bound to want to taxonomize and understand the um, not just kind of picture a lot of people like to read by picturing people kind of the film of these people but especially to understand um, why a certain character is doing something um, based on their race and their upbringing and that upbringing is tied to race and because this is not at all a story that is uh, devoid of race. It is absolutely a story about race. It's just that we just don't get the shortcut of knowing uh, what is a signifier of one race versus the other. Um, because it, she's constantly complicated and complicating and obfuscating what could be a racial signifier. Who's more likely to have a nightclub dancing mother versus a sick mother who's um, uh, really God-fearing and kind of judgy? Who's more likely to be uh, years later going to a Jimi Hendrix concert versus um, working as a waitress? Uh, and at every juncture, uh, it's extremely ambiguous and possible. Uh, it's narrated in first person, so you could assume, okay, fine, probably the narrator is the black one. Toni Morrison is black, so probably she's, uh, she's writing in first person um, as, you know, kind of a, a version of herself, but that's absolutely not true, absolutely not true either, so 
yeah, I loved this. Sorry, I'm very sniffly because I'm allergic to my autumn clothes and caffeinated and <laughs> I'm not completely coordinated between uh, my thoughts and I think my tongue is um, getting away from me sometimes, so you're welcome. Uh, I also finished yesterday uh, Boulder by Eva Baltazar, um, translated by Julia Sanchez, and I also really, really loved this. Um, Boulder is the main character narrator of this story. She is sort of this out of place um, woman who willfully doesn't want to make to uh, spread roots somewhere. So when we first meet her, she's a cook in a freighter ship. Uh, she, as part of that, meets a uh, woman named Sam Samsa, um, whom she falls in love with, and eventually moves to Iceland for. And so they have a, a steamy relationship for a while, but then Samsa uh, wants a child. And that starts to really change their relationship and Boulder's um, view of her, view of herself. Uh, the writing is really, re really beautiful. I love Sanchez's uh, uh, translation. Uh, it's extremely sexy. There are some beautiful, gorgeous, and steamy uh, descriptions of sex and uh, lust and desire. Uh, it's sad, it's lonely, it's about alienation. I had to step away for a second to take a sneezing break. I am a physical mess today, uh, but I took this opportunity to pick out a couple of sentences that I liked. Um, when Boulder, Boulder is a nickname given to her by Samsa, by the way, she's sort of renamed. Um, when they first meet, uh, I drink her like I'd been raised wandering the desert. I swallow her as if she were a sword, little by little, and with enormous care. Just such a delightful uh, description. Uh, or later on, um, like illness, celibacy makes us more human. It's not that it takes hold of my body. No, it takes over my body's temperament. I can feel it burrowing, leaving a perfectly round hole. I can sense it tunneling into me until it's found the perfect place to build a nest. Or just a couple pages later, of Samsa. She devours every Wednesday hour because every other hour of every other day is like a vampire that wants her with a love that bleeds her dry. So there's just so much um, like personality and a, definitely eroticism in so much of this book. Uh, and the, one of the major themes of body and lust and sexuality and desire as being such a factor in knowing your own personality uh, is something that's very interesting to me. So yeah, very, very glad that I picked up Boulder. I am definitely interested in also reading Permafrost by Eva Baltazar. I think probably also uh, translated by Julia Sanchez as well. Um, I'll make a correction if that's not true. Um, and it's also a very short book, so maybe it'll be another tiny book um, that I read uh, as part of this challenge. All right, that's it for now. So I figured I would do a little bit of a reading update. First of all, yes, hello, I have pink hair. Uh, happy October. I didn't do it because it's October. It just happens to be October 1st and mostly it's because I happen to have the day off uh, miraculously today. So that's 
one of the things I did so far. Um, I have finished three more short books and I'm in the process of reading two others. Uh, this morning, speaking of having the day off, I lazed around in bed and I listened to the entirety of the audiobook of Love Me Tender by um, Constance Debré. Love Me Tender, also it's the English title. It is translated into English. Uh, I don't know if there's an audiobook of the English translation, but the French uh, audiobook is super short. It's just about two hours, so I just kind of was able to start it and finish it in one morning. Um, I've been meaning to read Debré for a little bit because she's been kind of vaguely on my radar and then increasingly more. Uh, she just came out with a new book uh, recently, which my friend brought back for me actually from Paris. Um, this one is not yet translated into English. But in parallel also, Rebecca of Rebecca Eats Books was singing the praises of Love Me Tender on Instagram, so that kind of got me perked up for that. Uh, in brief, it is a memoir of Debré coming out a little later in life as a lesbian, or at least as not straight and starting to date women. Um, and specifically, Love Me Tender is about the dissolution of her marriage um, and her husband or her ex-husband trying to deny her custody of her son, of their son. Um, so it's a story about, you know, everything kind of falling apart, somebody um, losing everything, her, her husband, her marriage, her home, uh, and her son, and kind of starting anew. Um, it's about love and relationships uh, her her relationships to the various women that she's dating, um, but also very much her relationship to her son. Uh, it expounds a view of motherhood that you don't necessarily always get from people who actually do love their children. Uh, she loves her son, wants to be with her son, is given joy by seeing him when she can, but also doesn't want her identity to be exclusively that of mother. Uh, and she's not comfortable jumping through the hoops of femininity, of an imposed femininity, in order to prove that she deserves uh, to be a mother. Uh, this month for Katie James um, book club, we read uh, War Sun Shire's uh, Bless the Daughter Raised by a Voice in Her Head. So I read that this week as well. And in fact, just this afternoon, we met over Zoom to talk about it um, with some YouTube faves, including uh, Renee of So I Read This Book and Pato. Uh, I'm sorry, everyone. I think I talk way too much. So you're welcome and thank you for having me. Oh, I'm glad that I now match this book cover really, really well. Uh, I really, really enjoyed this uh, selection of poems. Uh, Shire is a Somali refugee, and this is a series of poems about um, that violent transition and uh, growing up in Britain as a refugee. It's about uh, girlhood and uh, growing up uh, dealing with what it means to be a girl and transitioning into teenhood, into adulthood, and all of the complicated facets of that. It's about beauty and presentation, uh, belongingness. So as a refugee, um, as somebody who's not white, as an outsider, foreigner, uh, but also within a family, um, torn between two cultures, um, and none of it really by choice. Uh, it's about her role in her family and her relationship to her parents, um, especially her mother. We were talking about this uh, a lot this afternoon. And um, yeah, it's really lovely. I was talking a lot this afternoon about um, the use of pop culture in this, which felt really nice um, and kind of very appropriate to, uh, oh wow, I'm, <laughs> I'm just realizing that, well, this is, this will be taken as 
uh, still for this video at some point because it's just too perfect. Uh, anyway, before I get distracted by my own image, uh, I was talking this afternoon about um, how much pop culture, even and kind of banal pop culture, makes its way into um, people's stories who are just trying to grow up and live. And so she has uh, a harrowing story of escape and of looking for belongingness in a much you know, broader geopolitical sense, but that also is represented through uh, her relationship to Angela Bassett and to Dawson's Creek. And uh, so I like how much she's able to talk about just gigantic themes and little threads that make up a personality, an identity, and an experience. So I'm very glad that I read that. Thank you, Katie. I also read Minor Detail by Adania Shibley uh, and translated by Elizabeth Chiquette. Uh, this was a hard read. <laughs> I can't say that I enjoyed it uh, and in fact really disliked it in some ways. Uh, I still recommend it actually. It is a good book but it's a tough read, uh, especially for me the first half was uh, not just hard to deal with because of its subject matter, but also boring and by design. Uh, so what is this about? Um, this is it's very starkly in to have. The first half is in third person and follows an Israeli soldier in 1949 as he is um, leading a troop to um, expel, kind of hunt down uh, Bedouin inhabitants of uh, the Negev desert um, to, you know, settle Israel um, as uh, the newly formed Israeli government sees fit. And it is boring in that it is full of the minor details of his life um, as a soldier and it's horrifying in that uh, they kill a bunch of people except for a young woman um, whom they rape and then finally do kill her. Uh, spoiler alert. So it's very tough subject matter. Uh, the second half lightened up for me, not because it was not difficult subject matter, but um, at least I didn't feel claustrophobic in the same way of following the kind of hour by hour life of this soldier. Uh, the second half is in first person and is taking place in modern day. Uh, we follow a Palestinian woman who was born uh, exactly 25 years after uh, that rape and murder that took place in 1949. And she becomes really obsessed about finding out the details of this in many ways, unfortunately, kind of not particularly um, special event. It is just kind of one of many atrocities that go on in wars and invasions and, and in you know political contestations. Uh, so she becomes really, really um, interested in this specific story and it follows her uh, attempt to get more information about what is really just a little footnote uh, in history. Um, so yeah, I it took it's a very short book, thank God. Um, I'm glad that I decided to finish it. I nearly stopped, but because it was so short, I figured why not. Um, the second half kind of helped me. Um, it's interesting and important and you might very very well hate it for even even if you think that it's good. Um, so I don't know if I recommend it or at least not wholeheartedly. Uh, I, you should check it out if, if you have the stomach for it. And then meanwhile I am still uh, in the midst of reading two others. I 
basically barely started uh, Cold Enough for Snow by Jessica Au um, a couple of days ago and have been reading it today a bit more. Um, so far I'm really liking it. This is about a mother and daughter who take a trip to Japan together. Uh, but more on that when I have gotten farther into it. And yesterday I picked up Upstream by Mary Oliver, which is a series of essays. It's a little bit longer than uh, the typical, you know, under 150 pages prompt. I think this is just about 200 pages. It's a very fast read, uh, and I read a chunk of it yesterday. Um, and these are essays about life and writing in a lot of ways. Um, it's really beautiful, um, very kind of inspiring. For me, probably not quite as inspiring as it might be. I get kind of lost in the nature imagery. Um, and this is what I've found when trying to read Annie Dillard, for instance. Nature description and um, kind of person in nature, in the miracle of nature, doesn't really uh, amaze me quite as much as it does some other people. So it hasn't really lost me, but it, it doesn't kind of propel me forward the way that it could um, some others. Um, yeah, so I'll probably finish it in the next few days and then maybe I'll talk a little bit more about it. Oh, I feel that maybe I went long as always, and maybe was disorganized in my thoughts, as always. But, you know, that's my signature vibe. Happy Sunday morning. I have a comically long day ahead of me. I'm gonna head out shortly to sing my church gig. Then I'm probably gonna hang around for about an hour because I don't have time to come home. Then I'm recording a piece for a composer Right after that, I'm gonna hop on a train to Philadelphia with a friend, and we're gonna go see a new opera at Opera Philadelphia that we're excited about, and then we're gonna come back to New York, and I will be very tired, I think. It's a solemn experience. It's quite late. I'm back in New York waiting too long for the subway home and I have to say I'm pretty destroyed. I think I'm deciding to wrap up this vlog because we're already inching perilously close to 30 minutes of edited content or more or less edited content. Also looking over the previous videos uh, from last week I am so caught by how beautiful the weather was and how lovely. Last week was just all sunshine and orange light and shofars and apples. It was just a delight and this week continues to be gray gray gray. I did finish uh, Cold Enough for Snow by Jessica Au. This is very much a vibes over plot novel. Um, in short, uh, the narrator and her mother uh, travel together to Japan, mostly Tokyo, and do some tourism together uh, sort of as a means of bonding, getting reacquainted as adult daughter and aging mother in that relationship. Uh, another element of it is that the mother in the book comes from Hong Kong uh, and the daughter is presumably from Australia. I actually don't think it's ever specified where uh, they where they are now located but uh, the author is from Melbourne so I kind of assume that she's drawing upon her own experience uh, it doesn't terribly matter because it's very much uh, a an immigrant narrative or a first generation narrative um, bouncing between two cultures to a certain extent and feeling like part of your culture is disappearing um, from the mother's perspective and also from the daughter's per perspective feeling like she doesn't have a certain part of her culture because she's in a new place um, so a disconnection to her roots to her mother's roots um, the story weaves in and out of the present where they are um, together in Japan and the memories and thoughts 
of especially the narrator, um, her childhood, her relationship to her mother, uh, contemplations on her mother's childhood as well, uh, growing up poor in Hong Kong, um, her relationship to her sister, uh, the narrator's relationship to her sister, the, her relationship to her partner. Um, it was really lovely, very pensive and beautiful, and yeah, I recommend. I have still not finished Upstream, and I'm not pressing myself to finish it particularly quickly. I'm um, like a little over halfway through. Uh, I'm now in a section when she's talking more specifically about writers, um, Emerson, Whitman, Poe, uh, and this interests me more specifically, as I mentioned last time. Uh, the second section is really, really more about her place in nature, which is phenomenal. She writes about nature famously well. You don't go into Mary Oliver thinking, oh, I'm not going to have anything about nature. And this is specifically a book about her kind of contemplations of herself uh, in nature and in literature. So. I knew what I was getting into, but that doesn't speak to me as much as words. I also am unsure about the second or third essay, I think. The third essay in the first section, um, which is called uh, Of Power and Time, which is about the creative process and being an artist. And she, she has a more um, sublime view of creativity and artistry than I do. Uh, it is partially because I'm an artist who doesn't have to create whole cloth all that much. Um, my creative process is interpretation most of the time, so there is so much of a practice to my um, artistry and necessarily uh, so I do, I am one of those people who thinks that so, so much of artistry is really just doing the thing over and over again, which she doesn't refute, but she brings in a little bit more of the, you know, common person versus artist dichotomy than I entirely agree with. Um, I need to reread the essay, it's extremely short. If you've read it, uh, or if you want to read it, chat with me about of power and time. I, yeah, and also what your views on how, how creativity erupts, um, how, <clears throat> excuse me, how habit-based is it for you, um, and how kind of sublimated or divine is it? because I'm getting that sense from her and I don't buy it. Uh, another book that is essay-ish, literally essays, <laughs> and unfinished is uh, Oh to Be a Painter by Virginia Woolf. This is uh, just a little a short collection of um, various thoughts and essays on art, on visual art from Virginia Woolf, uh, comp uh, compiled from several decades, um, David Zwerner books put it together. A friend of mine uh, lent it to me the other evening. Um, and similarly, I don't know if I will read all of these very, very quickly. Um, they are the sort of thing I really like, which is uh, a creative person of some kind um, having thoughts about a creative person or people or um, medium of another kind. So it's worth um, delving into if you're into Virginia Woolf, certainly, and um, if you're into art. It's funny because this is also very, very much from the 20s, especially. I don't know if it goes um, what what the full range of it, but basically, yeah, it goes into it does go into the 30s. I'm, I've been stuck in the 20s for the first uh, chunk of the book, um, and it's, all, it's very, very much a, an experience of art that is modernist, or pre-modernist as well, and so it's, it's pre-post-modernist in terms of the dichotomies of different art genres, and the, um, the reception of art, and the 
the lines between art forms or different creative forms. Uh, so some of the things, I mean, of course, it's just one person's uh, point of view of what art is, and it's not wholly because uh, she's writing from the modernist era, because plenty of modernist thinkers, writers, uh, painters, musicians were very, very much doing a bunch of things at once. Um, but it's a little bit more clearly delineated as to what it means to be a painter, what it means to be a writer, um, than I entirely agree with. I think I started a sentence and then finished a different one, but so what? That's what we're doing. Uh, and I mentioned on Instagram that I was gonna start um, Calvino's Mr. Palomar, Italo Calvino. This is translated by a person, I forgot. Uh, William Weaver from The Italian. I did not start it yesterday. Uh, but I think I'm going to read it. I have never read any Calvino. This is kind of a random one. I could pick up some of his more uh, famous things, um, but this is what I picked up, so I may as well read it first. However, because I'm currently reading uh, Jhumpa Lahiri's Translating Myself and Others, uh, it's actually gotten me itching to read more Italian again. Uh, so I might, if I can find this in Italian, I might actually just read it in the original language, but we'll see. That sort of is contingent upon the libraries at my disposal, which are admittedly very vast, but still. Um, yeah, that's all I've got for you. This has been a very, very good uh, tiny books challenge. I've read a lot of books and I have really, really liked uh, nearly all of them uh, and have found all of them interesting or worth reading. So minor detail is sort of the one that I can't say that I enjoyed reading, but that I can't say that I don't recommend. Um, so very successful. Okay, I think all of my thumbnails have me facing the same direction. I'm always this way, that way. What is it?